Hello, everyone. Welcome to our first session of our introductory RCET webinar, an inside look at how NASA measures air pollution. I'll be giving the webinar today. My name is Dr. Melanie Follette Cook. I'm a research scientist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Washington, DC. We at RCET were inspired to create today's webinar by all the media coverage we've been seeing recently of the decreases in air pollution we see in the satellite data. These decreases correspond to decreases in economic activity due to the many stay-at-home orders across the country and across the world. A lot of the media coverage has focused on satellite observations of nitrogen dioxide, or NO2. So this training will introduce new users of satellite data to how satellites make their measurements, what pollutants are measured from satellites, do's and don'ts for interpreting what we see in the satellite data, and how to access and visualize NASA data. This is session one of this two-part webinar series called Measuring Nitrogen Dioxide from Space. And that's me in the lower left corner. Hello. The RCET program manager, Dr. Ana Prados, is giving the presentation in Spanish later today. And you can see her there in the center. Dr. Pawan Gupta and Dr. Prados will be presenting session two, Measuring Aerosols from Space on Thursday, May 28th. Before we start today's presentation, I'd like to provide a brief introduction to the RCEP program. Since 2009, our program has provided freely available education in applied remote sensing through online and in-person instruction. Our courses are offered at several levels of difficulty in order to fit the wide variety of learner needs. They cover a variety of NASA missions and how to apply the satellite observations to real world applications. We offer our courses across many themes, air quality, disasters, land, and water applications. Past course rep recordings and training materials are available for free through our website and YouTube channel playlist. You can click on the link shown here. To learn about future trainings, you can connect with us through Twitter and sign up to our listserv. RCET has an international audience of participants from across many sectors, including academia, both faculty and students, the private sector, and all levels of government. As demand for satellite remote sensing grows, so has our audience and level of participation. In 2019, we had a record attendance with over 12,000 participants. Today, we'll talk about only one of the many NASA satellite missions, Aura. Join us for other ARSA trainings to learn about other NASA missions, such as, for example, Landsat for land applications, GPM to learn about precipitation, or SMAP to learn about soil moisture. You can gain access to these trainings through our website and YouTube playlist. So back to today. Our goals for this webinar are to help you, the user, understand exactly what satellites measure, what maps like these seen on the right hand of your screen are actually showing, and describe the capabilities and limitations of satellite NO2 observations. At the end, I'll show, I'll show you how to find and create satellite NO2 imagery. You might wonder why NASA is concerned with air pollution. Outdoor air pollution is responsible for millions of deaths every year. In 2016, air pollution was responsible for 4.2 million deaths. 91% of the world's population lives in a region where the air quality exceeds the guidelines set by the World Health Organization, or WHO. These regions are frequently the most poorly monitored from the ground. We'll see in this presentation how satellite data can help fill in that gap and help quantify the impact of poor air quality on human health. NASA provides many satellite observations that are re relevant for air quality, such as ozone, carbon monoxide or CO, 
nitrogen dioxide, NO2, sulfur dioxide, SO2, and greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide or CO2 and methane. NASA also provides satellite observations of aerosols, which Dr. Pawan Gupta will discuss on Thursday. Today, we're going to focus on satellite observations of nitrogen dioxide, or NO2. So why are we going to focus on NO2 and not something that you've probably heard of more often, like ozone? Well, like ozone, NO2 is a criteria pollutant regulated by the EPA because it's harmful to humans and ecosystem health. NO2, along with sunlight and other carbon compounds, actually produce ozone near the surface. Sources of NO2 are primarily from combustion of fossil fuels, like from cars, power plants, and manufacturing. Other sources of NO2 include lightning, emissions from soils, and fires. Because of this, most NO2 pollution is near the surface where people and ecosystems live and breathe. We're going to talk later more about why NO2 in particular is a useful um, air pollutant to measure from space. But before we jump into more in information about NO2, in this next section, we're going to introduce some basics of remote sensing. This slide shows three key components of air quality monitoring. Ground measurements, observations from air and from space, and computer models. Traditionally, air quality monitoring has been done using instruments on the ground. These monitors are usually very accurate, but as you can see in the map near the top, this map shows the location of ground monitors of NO2 around the globe. And you can see the large gaps in coverage even in countries with a lot of monitors like the United States. Satellite data helps fill in these gaps and provides information where there's no information from the ground. Atmospheric models are needed to predict future air quality, as well as providing information on species we cannot measure. Together, these three components can comprehensively observe and predict air quality. NASA has a large fleet of instruments that make Earth observations. These red arrows highlight the missions that make measurements that are relevant to air quality. Today, we're going to be focusing on measurements made by the Ozone Monitoring Instrument, or OMI, on board the Aura satellite. Satellites, instruments, sensors, I'm gonna be saying these words a lot throughout this webinar. And there's a difference between a satellite and a sensor or instrument. The satellite is the platform on which the instruments are placed. Sometimes there's one major instrument on board a satellite platform and the two names might be used interchangeably. Other satellites like Aura shown here have a lot of sensors. Aura has four instruments on board, OMI, TESS, HURDLES, and MLS. And again, today we're going to be focusing on OMI. What exactly is remote sensing? Remote sensing is the act of collecting information about an object without being in direct physical contact with it. Our eyes are actually a great example of a remote sensing system. Your eyes receive information about a scene and your brain processes and interprets this information. This is a simple example of passive remote sensing. But what if it's dark? We can't see on our own in the dark. But if we provide our own source of light, maybe a flashlight, then we can see. This is a simple example of active remote sensing, where we would provide the source of energy. The sensor is what collects information about the object that is interacting with the source of energy. Passive sensors, like OMI, depend on the sun as the sole source of light or energy. Solar radiation from the sun passes through the atmosphere, hits a target like a forest or water or city, 
And that energy is either absorbed, reflected, or transmitted back through the atmosphere. The intensity or strength of this reflected and emitted radiation is influenced by the characteristics of the surface, such as whether it's ocean, snow, ice, desert, as well as the characteristics of the atmosphere, temperature, humidity, clouds, gases, aerosols. Different wavelengths of light respond differently to physical properties of the surface or the atmosphere. So when solar radiation interacts with each of these, it contains the signature of those objects or the air it traveled through, and that is a key component of satellite remote sensing. For gases, like NO2, we know that each gas has a distinct spectra. So in other words, we know how and by what amount different molecules absorb radiation at different wavelengths. So we can identify a fingerprint for each atmospheric constituent. This slide shows a very simplified version of the remote sensing process from what the satellite measures to some of the quantities we're going to see today. Once radiation reaches the satellite, and remember, this energy contains the signature of the surface or the air it travels through, the sensor receives the wavelengths it's selected to measure. For example, OMI detects radiation in 740 wavelength bands. Along with this radiation, we use theoretical calculations involving radiative transfer theory, assumptions about the state of the Earth atmosphere system, and computer algorithms to estimate or retrieve geophysical quantities like NO2. It's very important that we emphasize that satellite retrievals are not direct measurements. Remember, satellites measure radiation and convert this information to geophysical parameters like NO2 using these theoretical calculations and assumptions. So there will be errors. This is why science teams spend a lot of time and effort to validate satellite data using other measurements. This helps us define these errors and uncertainties. Knowing these errors can help users of satellite data deter to determine if it's useful for their application. So maybe some of you are familiar with the saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, a satellite image is worth, can be millions of data points. Each pixel of a satellite image represents a geophysical number. In fact, a satellite image is really a two-dimensional array of individual elements arranged into columns and rows. These elements are called pixels and they are the smallest unit of an image or measurement. Each pixel has two characteristics or pieces of information, an intensity and a location. And the spatial resolution of a satellite is defined by the size of that pixel. Spatial resolution refers to the size of the smallest area that can be resolved. As the resolution increases or gets finer, different objects or features can be measured more precisely. These maps show NO2 from two different instruments. On the left is from OMI. OMI has a spatial resolution of 13 by 24 kilometers squared. And on the right is TROPOMI, another instrument we'll discuss briefly. Oh, TROPOMI has a finer spatial resolution of 5.5 by 3.5 kilometers squared. On these images, larger values of NO2 are seen in the warmer colors, yellows and reds. You can see in the image on the right, the features are smoother. And in some cases, like the hot, the small hotspot seen in Northern South Africa, this can only be seen in the higher resolution image. So higher resolution means that sometimes we can identify more features than in the lower resolution data. Many of the satellites in NASA's Earth observing system have what's called a polar orbit. 
These satellites move around the Earth from pole to pole and provide a global view of Earth. As the satellites are orbiting, the Earth turns underneath it. In a sun-synchronous orbit, the satellite passes over the equator and each latitude at the same local solar time each day, meaning the satellite passes overhead at essentially the same solar time throughout all seasons of the year. This lets us regularly collect data at consistent times, which makes long-term comparisons easier. OMI is an example of a sun-synchronous polar orbiting satellite. As a satellite orbits the Earth, the instrument sees a certain portion of the Earth's surface. The area on the surface is called the swath. In the image on the right, you can see the swath of the MODIS instrument on board the Terra satellite, another sun-synchronous polar orbiting satellite, for one day. Notice that over the course of the day, almost the entire globe is imaged, but there are gaps in coverage around the equator. This is a great animation showing the polar orbit of the Aura satellite and OMI taking observations. Note how the satellite orbit stays the same and the Earth spins beneath it. Also note the wide swath of the OMI instrument. If the swath of an instrument is wide enough, polar orbiting satellites can provide a snapshot of global images every day. For instruments with narrower swath widths, global coverage will take longer than one day. Again, these in this image, these are the swaths of the MODIS instrument on board the Terra satellite. Because of the gaps in orbit around the equator, MODIS takes one to two days to achieve true global coverage. And because of reasons I'll discuss in a couple of slides, OMI also provides global coverage in one to two days. The temporal resolution of an instrument refers to how frequently it can provide an observation of the same area on the Earth. As we can see here, that mostly depends on the swath width of the instrument. So in the last section, we introduced some basics of satellite remote sensing, what satellite instruments measure, and how they provide global coverage. Now we'll talk more specifically about OMI and the measurements it makes. The Ozone Monitoring Instrument, or OMI, is an instrument called a hyperspectral imager that collects information over 740 wavelength bands. OMI is on board the Aura satellite, which is a low Earth orbit at 705 kilometers above the Earth. It has an equator crossing time of about 1.45 p.m., meaning Aura passes over the equator at this time every day. OMI had a swath large enough to provide global coverage in one day. However, the row anomaly, and we'll discuss that in a couple of slides, has blocked several rows. The spatial resolution is 13 by 24 kilometers squared, but gets larger as you get towards the edges of the swath, where it can be over 100 kilometers. Several available products are listed here and include total and tropospheric column ozone, NNO2, aerosol optical depth in the UV, and total column formaldehyde and SO2. We're going to talk about what we mean by total and tropospheric columns in the next section. Advanced users of satellite data can download OMI data in its native resolution, or what's called level two data. Each satellite orbit comes in one data file, and an example is shown here on the right where you can see one single orbit. Level two data is usually available within a day or two of the satellite making its measurement. The OMI level two NO2 product is called OM NO2 and can be found at the website shown here on the right. If you're interested in using OMI level two data, a readme file for the data is shown here, as is a link to an advanced RSET webinar we did last year on NO2. 
NASA also provides OMI data on uniform grids. These are known as level three products and can be easier to use for new users. In order to create gridded level three products, the native level two data is filtered for quality, binned and averaged into uniform grids. Two grids are currently available. Um, NO2D is at a quarter of a degree, which is about 25 kilometers squared. And um, NO2D underscore HR is at 0.1 degrees, which is about 10 kilometers squared. They're both available as daily files or monthly average files at the website shown here. Several file formats are available and also shown on the slide. NetCDF and HDF5 file formats are binary and usually require other software to read them. There are a few important considerations to make when using OMI data. First, since 2008, OMI has experienced what's called the row anomaly. Because of a hardware issue on the satellite, some rows of data are not usable. This started in 2007 and grew until 2012, at which point it was affecting almost 50% of the data. It has not grown since 2012. You can see the effects of the row anomaly and the difference between the pre and post anomaly NO2 maps on the bottom of your screen. The areas in black, the stripe features in black on the bottom right hand plot. You can see that is the row anomaly. If you're interested in using level two data, additional filters and quality flags must be applied to the data before any analysis. We cover a lot of this in our advanced webinar if you're interested. These filters and quality flags have already been applied when creating gridded level three data, but some information is inevitably lost by averaging data from different pixels to generate the uniform grid values. TropoMe is another instrument that measures NO2. TropoMe was launched on the Sentinel-5P satellite by the European Space Agency. TropoMe also provides global coverage and higher spatial resolution than OMI. We saw an example of this earlier when we were talking about spatial resolution. Today, we're focusing on OMI because of its long historical record. TropoMe has been making measurements since late 2017 as opposed to 2005 for OMI. This long record from OMI allows us to place results we see today in context of a much longer historical record. If you're interested in learning more about TropoMI, we devoted an entire session to it in our advanced NO2 webinar. Now that we know more about satellite measurements and NO2 products from the OMI instrument, in this next section, we're going to focus on interpreting what we see in NO2 images. For example, here we see an image created using OMI gridded NO2 data, but what are we actually looking at? When a ground monitor is making a measurement, it's measuring the amount of pollution at the Earth's surface. When a satellite instrument is making a measurement, it's seeing the whole atmosphere. So satellite measurements of NO2 and many other gases are called total column measurements. And they represent the amount of NO2 from the surface to the top of the atmosphere. Atmospheric columns usually have units like molecules per centimeter squared. This means the number of molecules in the atmospheric column within a one centimeter squared area on the Earth's surface. The atmosphere and total column are made up of several layers, each with its own distinct characteristics. You can see some of these layers here. We want to focus on the lowest layer, the troposphere. The troposphere is where we live. See, you are here at the surface. The troposphere is where almost all weather and clouds occur. It's important to distinguish between the total column, the troposphere column, and the surface. The total column is the column from the surface to the top of the atmosphere. The tropospheric column 
is the column from the surface to the top of the troposphere. And the surface is just at the surface. Columns have units of molecules per centimeter squared. Surface measurements usually have measurements in terms of mixing ratio, such as parts per million or PPM, or concentration, such as micrograms per meter cubed. Using information from other instruments, OMI tropospheric column NO2 is calculated from OMI total column NO2. Typically, both quantities are available within a data file. So users should pay attention to which one they're using. For the rest of this presentation, we're going to focus on tropospheric column NO2. So again, the amount of NO2 from the surface to the top of the troposphere. So what can a tropospheric column tell me about the surface? Instruments like OMI can't really distinguish where in the troposphere column a constituent is. However, some information on the vertical distribution of a pollutant can be inferred by taking a couple of pieces inf of information into account. Where are the pollutant sources? In the case of NO2, the primary source of NO2 is combustion from cars and power plants. So most NO2 sources are at the surface. Another factor to consider is how long a pollutant stays in the atmosphere or its lifetime. Near the surface, NO2 has a relatively short lifetime of a few hours, so high levels are usually found at the surface, near sources. This is represented by the light blue line in the picture on the right. Most of the NO2 troposphere column is usually located near the surface. Species with longer lifetimes, like days to weeks, are represented by the red line. These species can mix vertically and with surrounding air and make it difficult to infer any information about the surface using a column value. Because of the reasons I just discussed, NO2 short lifetime and high concentrations near the surface, changes in NO2 at the surface correspond very well with changes in the tropospheric column. The map on the right shows the percent change in surface NO2 measurements from 2005 to 2013. The map on the left shows the percent change in the tropospheric column measurements from OMI. These changes show very good agreement. So let's revisit this image again, and we can say a lot more about it now. First, we can see the color bar. It shows tropospheric column NO2, or again, the amount of NO2 from the surface to the top of the tropos tropopause. If we process and interpret this image carefully, NO2 levels observed from OMI can give us information about NO2 levels at the surface. We can also see this image shows an average of a 30-day period over three years. On this image, we can see local and regional features. We can see higher values or darker colors of NO2 over several cities, as well as high NO2 levels associated with electricity generated by thermal power plants in Eastern India. This animation on the right shows just how different tropospheric column NO2 in March can be different from year to year, from 2015 to 2020. And we've described how and why changes in tropospheric columns can give us information about changes at the surface. So what changes NO2 at the surface? Changes at the surface will always be some combination of emissions, chemistry, and weather. We're going to discuss each of these in more detail. First, emissions. The amount of NO2 emitted from a given source can vary depending on fuel type or other conditions, but emissions can also change because of increased use of renewable energy or an air quality or climate change policy or regulation, usually involving cleaner technology. Emissions can also change because of unexpected changes, such as economic recession, natural disasters, widespread stay-at-home orders, such as 
due to the current pandemic. Also, sudden policy interventions, such as in advance of the Beijing Olympics. Next, chemistry. NO2 and other pollutants are always being emitted into the atmosphere, but after, they're admitted, after they are emitted, they undergo chemical reactions that determine their lifetimes, or again, how long they stay in the atmosphere. The speed of these chemical reactions can change depending on factors such as the temperature or the amount of sunlight, which will lengthen or shorten a pollutant's lifetime. So for example, the seasonality and temperature every year will lead to a seasonality in the speed of many chemical reactions, and thus the amount of NO2. This is why you typically see the same period or months over different years. This allows us to account for seasonal changes in temperature and other variables. Finally, weather. We all know firsthand how variable weather can be from day to day and from year to year. Weather can also impact the amount of NO2 at the surface. Winds can disperse NO2 emissions, leading to either an increase or a decrease in pollution levels, depending on wind direction and speed. Sometimes high winds can spread out emissions, increasing mixing and lowering NO2 levels near the surface. As I mentioned during the last slide, Higher temperatures and more sunlight can speed up NO2 chemistry in the air. Rain can wash away pollutants, cleaning the air and lowering pollutant levels. In addition to reducing sunlight, clouds also interfere with satellite measurements. The map on the right shows troposphere column NO2 on May 10th, 2020. The striped black areas are the Omi Rho anomaly we talked about earlier. But you can also see other areas of black where there are no measurements. These correspond to areas with clouds. Here, I've included imagery from another instrument, VIRS, that shows the clouds that are interfering with the measurements. Remember our native resolution level two and gridded level three discussion? We should note that if a day or a month is especially cloudy over a region, that region is going to have less data points going into that gridded average. So now I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about these maps you see on your screen. So take a minute and look at them carefully. Note what is being measured and over what time periods. And I'm going to ask you a couple questions that review some of the concepts we've talked about today. Now, take a look at these maps. I'm going to ask you a couple questions about these maps. So take a minute and look at them carefully. This corresponds to slide 41 in your training materials. Note what is being measured and over what time periods. So in a minute, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that review some of the concepts we've talked about today. So if you want to have this slide handy in your slide deck um, while I uh, while I ask you a couple of questions, you can just pull that up again. It's slide 41. Okay, so I'm happy that 70%, uh, the correct answer is tropospheric column NO2. Um, this is different than total column NO2. Total column is from the surface to the top of the atmosphere. Tropospheric column is from the surface to the top of the troposphere or tropopause. Um, when we're looking at images such as these, we're looking at tropospheric column NO2. Tropospheric column NO2 is the quantity uh, when we see changes, will reflect changes at the surface. Um, why don't we go to the next question? Okay. Um, 
not sure if you can see it, but um, once again, slide 41 we're referring to are these images for one day? Yes, each map shows the NO2 data. No, or no, the maps show NO2 data average. So it's either one day, over a week, or over a month. So the majority got it correct. These maps uh, show NO2 average over one month. Um, for the top map, we're seeing um, one month averages over a three year period. And the bottom map shows the um, values for March 2020. Great. OK, next question. OK, this question. Um, is this map of gridded data? Is this a map of gridded data or the native resolution of the instrument? Okay, that's great. So 80%, the gridded data is correct. Um, the native resolution or swath data would represent one or more orbits of the OMI instrument. A level three data has been produced by NASA and it's gridded and involves carefully averaging and filtering the native resolution satellite data. We're seeing gridded data here. Uh, next question. So is this a map of NO2 at the surface? Yes, no, or we cannot say. Okay, so this is a little tricky. So this does not show a map of NO2 at the surface. Um, so the, the correct answer is no. The reason it's not we cannot say is because at the bottom of the map where you see the color bar, you can see the units. The units of this map are in molecules per centimeter squared. So we know that it's a column value and not a surface value, which is more often in units of mixing ratio, such as PPM or concentration or micrograms per uh, meter cubed. Um, so that's how we know what quantity we're looking at in these maps. Next question. Can changes in the tropospheric column tell me information about changes at the surface? Yes or no? Great. So yes, changes in the troposphere column can give us information about changes in the surface. This is specifically for NO2, primarily because sources of NO2 are um, primarily at the surface and because of NO2 short lifetime near the surface. It means that in the column, most of the NO2 is at the surface, which is why for NO2, changes in the troposphere column can give us that information. Okay, last question. Okay, last question. Launch. Are the changes between the top and bottom images due to the economic slowdown because of COVID-19? Melanie? Okay, so are all of the changes between the top and the bottom Im image due to the economic slowdown? So the keyword there is all. So the answer is no. All of the changes are not due to the economic slowdown. Um, the amount of NO2 at the surface is always going to depend on emissions, chemistry, and weather. So there's always going to be some piece of each of these components in changes that we see. So if we want to calculate the change in NO2 from only, say, the reduction in economic activity due to the pandemic, 
um, that requires careful and rigorous scientific analysis. So we can say that, of course, some of it is, of course, due to the economic slowdown, but we can not say that all of it, there will always be also changes in chemistry and changes in weather. Um, in this next section, we're going to highlight a few applications of OMI NO2 data. OMI data has been used for a wide variety of applications, including monitoring changes in air pollution, and we'll show a few examples here. To review, changes in pollution could be due to air quality regulations, increases in renewable energy, or changes in economic output. OMI data has also been used to detect sources such as power plants, tar sands, or smelters, and also can serve as a proxy for pollutants that are emitted at the same time, like carbon dioxide. Agencies like the EPA use OMI data to evaluate their air quality models, and assimilation of OMI ozone data has been used to improve air quality simulations and forecasts. OMI has widely been used to detect long-term improvements in air quality over the United States. These maps show changes in troposphere column NO2 from 2005 to 2018 from OMI. Large decreases on the order to 20 to 60% are seen over urban areas. These maps show recent decreases in NO2 from March 15th to April 15th as compared with the 2015 to 2019 average of the same period. Levels this year were 30 to 40% lower than the previous five-year average. From our previous discussion, we know that some of this decrease is certainly due to reduction in economic activity due to the current pandemic. But year-to-year -year changes in weather and long-term improvements in air quality are also part of this change. For example, Florida is currently having a record warm and dry season. This certainly plays into the levels of NO2 there. Similarly, in South Asia, NO2 levels from March 25th to April 25th are 30 to 60% lower than the previous three years. Some of the highest reductions are seen over densely populated areas with the strictest stay-at-home orders. OMI has also been used to detect NO2 increases associated with oil and natural gas activities. The left maps show changes in OMI NO2 from 2005 to 2014, while more urban areas like Bismarck, North Dakota, and Houston, Dallas, and Austin, Texas show decreasing NO2 trends in blue colors. Other areas show significant increases. Increases can be seen in the warmer red colors. Looking at the Veers night lights at night, Veers lights at night <laughs> products on the right, we can see these areas are lit up not because of population or cities, but because of gas flaring. Some researchers have used troposphere column NO2 to calculate estimates of surface level NO2 using information about the NO2 vertical distribution from an atmospheric chemistry model. This table shows information about one satellite-based surface NO2 estimate developed here at NASA Goddard by Luke Lemsaw. These estimates are monthly and available at 0.1 by 0.1 degree resolution from 2005 to 2016 at the website shown here. So in, last, in this last section of our webinar, I'll review where to download OMI data, and I'm going to demonstrate two websites where you can download or create your own OMI, OMI NO2 imagery. OMI native resolution level two and gridded level three data can be downloaded from the Goddard Earth Sciences Data and Information Services Center or JESDISC. Register for an Earth Data account in order to download data. 
Gridded data and images can also be downloaded from the Aura Validation Data Center website. For more information and a tutorial about downloading OMI data, you can view our advanced NO2 webinar. NASA Worldview is a tool that can be used to create imagery and animations. Dr. Pawan Gupta will demonstrate how to use Worldview on Thursday. So now, the first website that I'm going to demonstrate is the NASA Goddard, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center Air Quality website. So I'm going to exit out of my presentation and go to airquality.gsfc.nasa.gov. And all of the information that I am going to go over now is also in your training materials. So here we see the front page of the NASA Air Quality website. On the sidebar, we see links to um, other relevant programs, the NASA Food Security Initiative, the NASA Air Quality Forecast, NASA RSET, the NASA Health and Air Quality Applied Sciences team, and NASA Applied Sciences. So you can click on any of these links to find out more information about these programs. The front page has the latest news, and we're going to uh, look at a couple of these tabs. The Pollutants tab has more detailed information about nitrogen dioxide, ozone, and particulate matter. We're gonna click on the nitrogen dioxide link. In here, you can find animations and very nice maps that you can download and are freely available. Here's also Global NO2. Scrolling back up to the top, there is access to more downloadable images for the top 20 US cities, top 195 world cities, and top 150 US power plants. If we go to the top 20 US cities, it'll bring up a new tab. And we can see for several cities, a lot of imagery um, has been created. So let's click Washington DC, near where NASA Goddard is located. And we have some pre-made maps of OMI tropospheric NO2 from 2016 over Washington area. We also have the change in tropospheric column from 2005 to 2016. All of these changes have been negative, so less values and uh, lower values in 2016 than 2005. So we see a lot of these blue colors here. And we see the same map, but instead of the actual column change, it's in percent. We also see what are called time series plots of NO2 over Washington. On the y-axis, we see OMI tropospheric column NO2. And on the x-axis, we see monthly OMI, uh, I'm sorry, on the x-axis, we see time and it's monthly data. So each dot here corresponds to a monthly average. And we have a nice satellite image of Washington, DC. And here you can find data and maps for many, many different cities. So going back to the main page, this other, this impacts tab has information about the impacts of air quality on human health and food, food security. I'm gonna skip over news for a second to go to resources. Here you can find information on web tools and data, several pre-made fact sheets, other air quality websites, outreach activities and references for a lot of the information on this website. If we go to the news tab, we can see recently created imagery. For example, OMI SO2 changes over India, pre and post pandemic, Los Angeles for NO2, South Asia, you'll recognize a lot of these I've used in my own presentations. Uh, Southeast US, Florida, here's some an Earth Observatory article on 
um, aerosols um, over the Northeast US and the movie that I showed earlier of the Northeast US. All of this imagery is downloadable and freely available. If you click on the Read More, you can find out more about each of these images. These are these really neat slider images where you can see the before, which is a five-year average in March, from March 25th to April 25th, and the March 25th to April 25th average for 2020. And all of this imagery can be downloaded by clicking this link. So this website is a valuable source of information and a way to get already created imagery. But if you want to make an O2 map over a particular region, that's where our next tool comes into effect. So Giovanni is a online visualization and analysis tool. So in this next part of our demonstration, um, I'm going to show you how you can make maps using Giovanni. Um, I want to emphasize all steps of this demonstration are in the training materials, a step-by-step -step walkthrough. So you don't need to bring up Giovanni and do these steps as I do them, but if you do want to follow along, please use this site, this disc-beta.gsfc.nasa.gov slash Giovanni, um, because this allows us to have, uh, because of the number of users going on at one time, um, we want to minimize the effect on the actual Giovanni website. So they've created this separate site. So to, if you'd like to follow along, please take a minute and type this into your browser, or you can access this um, link from the training materials. If you find that you're trying to follow along and it's not working, or you have a question, we can definitely address it during the question and answer period, or you can always feel free to email me after the webinar. So I'm going to give everybody a minute to bring it up if they want to. Okay, and now I am going to go to the Giovanni website. So I am going to use the regular Giovanni website that you would use if you are not participating in the webinar at this moment. But again, if you're going to follow along, please use that beta website. So this is the front page of Giovanni. If you're going to follow along, please make sure you're logged into your Earth Data account it won't allow you um, to make the plots that we're going to make today um, without an Earth Data account. So on the top here, we have select plot, and you can see that there are several categories of plots, maps, comparisons, vertical, time series, and miscellaneous. Mousing over the types of maps, you can see time averaged map, animation, difference of time averaged, so two different uh, variable maps, an accumulated map, time averaged overlay, where you can overlay, um, say you have a color map, a color contour map, you can overlay contours of a different variable over that colored contour, monthly and seasonal averages. And also note this details link, clicking on this, um, I'll just go ahead and click on it, will bring you to descriptions so plot and service types will bring you to a description of every single kind of map that Giovanni offers and what exactly it is in some of the options. So going back, we also have comparisons. So you can make a correlation map, different types of scatter plots, vertical cross sections and profiles, time series plots, so I showed one of those pre-made time series plots on the air quality website. Here you can create your own over a given region. 
and miscellaneous zonal mean and histogram plots. So the first thing we're going to do, to do is we're going to scroll down and select our NO2 measurement. So we're going to drop down the measurements menu on the left and scroll down. You can see all the wide variety of variables that Giovanni has available. We're going to click NO2 and scroll back up to see what we've got. Now we have two different variables here, NO2 total column and NO2 tropospheric column. And we know from our previous discussion that we're going to choose the NO2 tropospheric column. Here's some information about the product per centimeter squared. So it's molecules per centimeter squared from OMI. This is available for every day at quarter of degree resolution. Remember, uh, previously I talked about um, NO2D, which is the gridded um, level three product. Data is available beginning in October 2004 and is available as recently as a couple of days ago. So now that we've selected our variable, we're going to go up and select our date and over our region. So I should have specified, we're going to make a time averaged map today. So similar to the maps that we saw um, earlier in our presentation. So let's start by choosing a time period. So let's choose 2005. And we're going to choose a monthly average of April. So we're going to start with April 1st of 2005. And we're going to include all values until April 30th. So a monthly, and if you're doing this and following along on your own and choosing your own time period, I advise you not to choose a very long time period. Um, it can, especially with all the different users on, it can make the system very slow. So please restrict any analyses you're doing on your own to a month or less for now. And now we're going to select a region over which to make our map. By clicking here, you can select different shape files. I am going to select this to select my own bounding box. So this, clicking on this hand, lets you pan around, or you can zoom in and out. This select, lets you select your bounding box. So I'm going to select a small region over the Northeast US. And again, if you're doing your own analysis here, please select a small region over which to calculate your map. Closing this, we see our bounding box listed here. And now we go down to plot data. And it just takes a minute. This is part of the reason why I advised um, over not too long of a time period and over not too big of a box. So, because it takes a couple minutes to generate the plot. So here's our map. I wanna note a couple of things here. First, this is our history. So you can see I've made other maps earlier. So this is what happens when you are making multiple maps, and we're going to do that today. This is my current map. On the top here, we have time average map, NO2 tropospheric column, daily, quarter degree, and the product name in the unit, over the time period, and the bounding box. Here, we have the download button where you can download this image in GeoTIFF, KMZ, or PMG formats. Going over here, we see another download. If we click that, we can, this is another way to download in those three formats, but also you can download the data that's being plotted in NetCDF format. And we can return to our plot by clicking plots.
So clicking on the options drop down menu, we can remove our title. We can remove the other subtitles, captions, legends, coastlines, countries, and our grids. And I want to draw your attention to these options. So you can view, you can change the color palette of your plot. I'm going to stick with this color palette. Um, but I am going to change the maximum range. So this is the data range over which it's plotted. And in order to compare this image with other years, I'm going to change the maximum to, right now it's 2 times 10 to the 16th. So I'm going to change this to 1. I'm also going to turn on smoothing to make my map look smoother. And click replot. And we just give it a minute. And we click this to minimize. And we have a nice, smooth looking map of Troposphere Column in O2. But suppose I want to compare this map or you know, put it side by side with a map from a different time period. In order to do that, we can go click this button back to data selection. And it brings us all of our choices are still saved here. So suppose I want to make a map. Now I want to look at 2015. All of the information is saved. All I have to do is click plot data. And it will begin to create a new map. And again, if you're experiencing long wait times, um, if you're doing this and following along on your own, don't worry. This uh, everything step by step is in the training materials. So here we see our new map for 2015 instead of 2005. And if we change our color scale to match. what we chose for our previous time period. And let's turn on smoothing. So it's gonna look exactly, well, not exactly the same, but we're plotting it in the same way. So we can more easily compare the changes. Here we see, you can more easily see the features in 2015 because the NO2 levels are in general lower. And we can toggle back, um, back and forth with these plots. So I can easily access our last plot and our new plot by just clicking back and forth. So I'm sure everybody know what 2020 looks. So let's, let's do that real quick. Plot data. And we create our 2020 map. And here's our 2020 map. So again, we want to plot it the same way so we can more easily compare it. And we click on smoothing and replot. Close our menu. And so now we can, so this map is for 2020. You can see at the top our new time period. And we can compare that with 2015 and 2005. So you can see that this is a really powerful tool 
with which you can create your own maps or time series of NO2. Um, but remember, when we're comparing maps that say the difference between 2005 and 2015 is always going to be a combination of emissions, chemistry, and weather. And remember, when we're looking at these maps, we're looking at troposphere column NO2. Um, so that concludes the demonstration part of our webinar, and I think we will open it up now uh, for questions. Thanks. Actually, first, I think we're going to demo uh, the RSET website. So here on your screen, you can see um, the RSET website, which is rset.gsfc.nasa.gov. If you click on the trainings tab, um, you can see uh, links to fundamentals and other applications areas, such as disasters, health and air quality, land and water resources. And on the right, you can see links to online trainings, in-person trainings. And from the main page, you can access the RSET listserv. So now we're going to switch to the Q&A portion of our webinar. Okay, so question one. The Indo Gangetic Plain has emerged as a hotspot in the world. Can ammonia concentration also be measured through remote sensing? And is there a direct correlation between NO2 concentration and concentration of NH3? So I see my colleagues have already started <laughs> putting some um, information in. Uh, NASA's Atmospheric Infrared Sounder or AIRS instrument on NASA's Aqua satellite does provide some ammonia measurements. More details can be found at the link here. Um, NASA's AIRS instrument is on NASA, the NASA Aqua satellite. Um, the NO2 likely won't correlate that well with ammonia. They have very different sources. Um, NO2, again, is primarily produced via combustion whereas ammonia um, primarily comes from agri agricultural sources. So question two, um, can the RSET team provide a training on how to get 3D air pollution retrievals from MISER? And my colleague, <laughs> Dr. Pawan Gupta, who's going to talk a lot more uh, about aerosols on Thursday's session, um, uh, MISER does not provide uh, gas measurements, but gives aerosol information. Um, but there's very limited data on the vertical distribution. So he'll talk more about this on Thursday. Um, question three, as a wildlife conservationist, are any NASA partners or affiliates quantifying um, poor air quality on animal versus health? So NASA is uh, primarily concerned with making satellite measurements. Um, as far as uh, calculating um, the effects of poor air quality on the health of humans or animals, that's usually done by different agencies collaborating with NASA. I don't know of any studies that are occurring right now. What is the difference between spectral radiance and irradiance? And my colleague, Dr. Gupta can correct me if I get this wrong, <laughs> but um, spectral radiance is um, the return of energy to the sensor at one given angle. And I believe irradiance deals with um, all the different angles. Um, but I believe he'll speak more about this uh, on Thursday. Okay. Can we convert the data into CSV? Because generally it is difficult to work on HDF and NetCDF data formats. Um, yes, see session three of <laughs> this um, uh, past RSET webinar. However, um, 
currently the so in that webinar we have provided python codes that do exactly that um, take hdf or netcdf files and output certain variables into ascii format but that is for level two native resolution data we're currently working on updating our codes to help users deal with level three data um question six how did we delete the other molecules above the troposphere and only focus on the troposphere um when no when the satellite retrieval of no2 is being done um they use uh, models and measurements from other satellites um, to calculate the amount of no2 above the troposphere and subtract that from the total column to get the tropospheric column. We focus on the tropospheric column because that is the quantity that corresponds most closely with changes at the surface. We also focus on tropospheric column because that's where um, most of the changes are happening and where we'll see the consequences of changing emissions. How can we compare the ground-based data, which is in PPM, and satellite data, which is in column, and the unit is molecules per centimeter squared? Um, so they, as I've discussed in the webinar, they relate to one another. But if you're asking about how you calculate um, the amount in PPM from the satellite, you need vertical information typically from a model. Um, there have also been methods, and my colleague is typing um, some information now, um, to use models to uh, derive the um, over a given location or region between the surface and the column. If the only image, sorry, question eight, if the OMI image contains so many obstruction factors as discussed in slide 40, like the like clouds and the anomaly, why is it still the standard data measurement for analysis? Um, I'm not, uh, hopefully I answer this question correctly. So um, satellite data in general is valuable for its spatial coverage. Um, it can provide information where no ground information is available. Um, also, OMI's long data record dating back to 2005 lets us look at the long historical record, which when we see changes in the present, we can place it in context with the historical record. Um, and question nine, how well does the troposphere column NO2 represent planetary boundary layer NO2 and surface NO2? Um, so how well the column represents, so planetary boundary layer refers to the layer of air closest to the surface. Um, and how well the column represents NO2 values in the boundary layer and at the surface will change. So I, I can't give you know, one number for everywhere, um, but in general, changes in the column will give us information about changes in the surface. Question 10, I understand decreasing con concentrations with height and the correlation with surface conditions. But there's no additional algorithm in the post-processing that says it is at the surface with certainty. No. Um, the, uh, could you scroll back up so I can see the question mark? Okay. Um, there is no additional algorithm in the post-processing that says it's at the surface. No, the, the retrieval algorithms will give um, tropospheric column NO2. 
any derived products from that um, will be known as a level four product. Um, you can do your own analysis with surface um, values to gauge how well the troposphere column matches the surface over your given region. Question 11, according to slide number 41, how can we calculate the monthly amount of NO2? Um, so if you would like to calculate your own monthly average, um, you can do so a variety of ways. Um, there are text files um, in some form, in, for some gridded, um, I can't remember whether texts are available for the quarter degree or the tenth of a degree, um, but you could average these over the course of the month. You could average daily files over the course of a month. Um, if, you, if your goal is to produce a map, you could use Giovanni, as I demonstrated earlier. Um, those monthly averages have been produced by averaging gridded daily data. So level three daily data averaged over the course of 30 days. Question 12, why does the India map show high values in geography without a city identified? Are these remote power plants? Yes, I believe they are power plants uh, for electricity generation in Eastern India. How do we actually identify if an image, sorry, question 13. <laughs> how do we actually identify if an image is a total column or a troposphere column data set? Um, unless you are in atmospheric research, most um, OMI products for NO2 will be tropospheric columns. They're the ones most relevant um, for many applications. Question 14, hello, at Giovanni, there are only ozone total columns in Dobson units data. I would like to know where I can find ozone tropospheric or surface data obtained by OMI. Is there another source for that? So ozone is an example of a longer lived pollutant where tropospheric, tropospheric column ozone will not give us a lot of useful information about ozone at the surface. Um, for tropospheric column ozone uh, from OMI, I believe they, uh, you're correct, they don't have it at Giovanni, but I believe they have that at the Aura Validation Center website. I've included a link to this website um, in the training materials. Question 15. Granted, we can't say all of the changes are relevant to COVID, but it seems like we could say most of them are, can we? Is that a fair statement of fact that a responsible journalist could state in a news story? If not, what is? So this is a, this is a great question. Um, I don't think, uh, responsibly, I don't think we can say most of it is, that implies greater than 50% of the change is due to COVID. And I would caution anyone to ascribe any kind of number um, that is a rapidly ongoing work, um, figuring out exactly how much of the decreases we see are due to COVID versus other factors. For example, we had a relatively cool, wet, uh, spring in the Northeast. We have to take that into account. And I know that there's a lot of going wor uh, ongoing work at NASA right now trying to detangle all of those different signals. So what can we say? We can say we can absolutely see the signal. We just can't say how much. Um, there's more information about language you can use and um, just uh, more information about interpretation on the airquality.gsfc.nasa.gov uh, website. They've put a really uh, useful document. Question 16. Hello. 
Question about the image we were just looking at on slide 41. Is there a way we can tell just from the image itself, outside of the context of this presentation, that this is troposphere column data rather than total column data? The magnitude of the values in the legend, maybe? Yes, that, that is one indicator. But most of the time, when you're looking at um, OMI and O2 data, um, this is question 16. Um, when you're looking at OMI and O2 data, most of the time you're going to be looking at tropospheric column. Um, total column NO2 is not typically used for many applications. Question 17. Right, so these are, these are great questions. I cannot ascribe percentage influences to, uh, associated with emissions, chemistry, and weather. That is going to be, uh, again, you need careful and rigorous scientific analysis to, to figure out the contributions of each um, to the overall signal. Okay, question 18. I'm interested to know if you have been able to measure ground level ozone from space, and if so, have you been able to remove the signal due to upper tropospheric ozone? No, um, there is no product uh, inferring surface ozone from tropospheric column ozone for the reasons I spoke about earlier. It's longer lived, so the column gives us less information about where exactly in the column the ozone is. So we don't really get a lot of information um, about the surface. How can the data be correlated with ground level concentrations? Um, so if you know, if you can, so if you know a ground station, you can obtain measurements from a local ground station and you can find, if you want to use gridded data, you can use the grid that corresponds with your local ground station and look at changes in that grid over time. For advanced users that want to use the unaveraged native resolution data, I would point you towards um, an RSET webinar we gave last year that's more of an advanced user webinar dealing with the native resolution data. Is there any relation, question 20, is there any relation between NO2, land surface temperature, and air temperature? Um, yes, so uh, the lifetime or how long NO2 atmosphere will depend on temperature. I'm not sure of the difference, made, the distinction made here between this, like the skin temperature and air temperature. But um, I would say that there's definitely going to be, there is definitely a relationship between NO2 and the temperature of the air. I didn't get, so question 21, I didn't get 0.1 by 0.1 degree resolution. Can you explain this in detail? Um, so 0.1 by 0.1 degree resolution corresponds to roughly 10 kilometer squared grid cells. Um, so that is the size of each of the grid cells. Are there any level four products as with other sensors on other platforms? So a level four product is going to correspond to um, products derived from the level three products. So an example of a level four product of NO2 is the surface estimate that I referred to in the, during the training. Um, and that you can find out more information about that at the website I linked there. But that's the only level four product for OMI NO2 that I'm aware of. Are there any commands or ways to make corrections to NO2 data from OMI data? Yes, if you're dealing with the native resolution level two data, there are definitely 
uh, filters and um, data quality uh, variables that you would want to look at. And I would again point you towards our advanced RSET webinar that we gave last year. Can you please explain the row anomaly again? So the row anomaly is the result of a hardware issue. So it's literally a piece of hardware blocking the view of the satellite. Um, so some rows of the satellite uh, orbit are blocked. Um, these values have been filtered out within the data. Question 25. The images are available for any country. I'm not sure what images um, this question is referring to. If there are already pre-made images on the airquality.gsfc.nasa.gov website, I don't think they're for every country, but many cities, uh, many international cities are available. If you are interested in making an image over your own country or region that's not covered under that website, um, you can use the procedure I showed during the training and make your own map using Giovanni. Question 26, we haven't touched on NO2 emissions from forest fires. Any comments in that regard? Point sources as compared to large forest fire areas. Um, in general, just to speak very broadly, um, the primary sources of NO2 are going to be from combustion. Um, so the signal from forest fires is typically not as large as from um, vehicles, manufacturing, power plants, et cetera. But yes, NO2 emissions definitely are produced by forest fires. And that can be significant, but in for the majority of occasions, um, the primary emissions of NO2 come from combustion, uh, man-made combustion. Did you say NO2 data is not available after 2016? Oh no, no. Um, OMI is still taking uh, measurements. Um, a lot of the imagery I showed was from uh, 2020. Um, and now Tropomi is also taking measurements. Um, what I might have said, it might be getting confused. Uh, the row anomaly um, has been stable since 2012. That might have been where some confusion um, came into account. Okay, question 28. Is there a list or compendium of the widely used indices or processing used for analytics? I'm more interested in level two data and want to avoid searching literature if someone has already aggregated the standard. Um, so, uh, well, first I would point you towards our advanced uh, NO2 webinar that we gave last year. And also, um, if you go to the slide that describes um, the level two data, it points to a README um, that was written by the retrieval team, and that should contain a lot of the information um, you're looking for. It'll contain recommended quality flags to consider, um, cloud fraction, variables like that. Question 29, is there any fine resolution data? What is the maximum resolution available as today? Yes, that's correct. The Tropomi satellite, <clears throat> which has been making measurements since 2017, has a spatial resolution of five by five by three and a half kilometers squared for NO2 and other gases. Question 30. While performing atmospheric modeling, we need to co-locate the variable temporally and spatially. Since all the satellite data have different spatial and temporal resolution, how to deal with such cases? Um, I guess I would say very carefully, um, since a model will be available um, everywhere at all times, um, you need to be careful about um, the adding that's gone into creating the satellite data, as well as the fact that the satellite data, for example, I'll use OMI again as an example, 
the satellite data gives you a picture at early afternoon, roughly about 1.30 local solar time. A model will give you values at all times. So you need to be very careful that you're comparing um, the appropriate time. So for each satellite data set, you're going to have to take all of that uh, into account. Question 31. Sometimes, and particularly in NO2 products, certain values are negative. So how do we deal with those values? Do we consider those data as missing data? No. Um, if you're creating um, a mean or uh, an average over a given area, or especially if you're averaging in, over a given area and looking at that change over time, um, the retrieval team advises that you include those values. It has to do with um, you know, the initial assumptions uh, made at the beginning of the retrieval. Um, missing data are flagged as very, very large negative values. Um, and again, when we're dealing with the native data where you'll get those uh, values, um, we would point you towards the uh, RSET webinar we gave last year. The README file also will guide you on how to handle these values. Question 32, how can we compare NO2 troposphere column data with ground data? Since both have different measurement height and unit, is there any way to integrate both of the data? Um, no, what you can do is you can see how they change in time or correlate them. How do changes in one relate to changes in the other? If you want to convert one to the other, you need three-dimensional information about uh, the distribution of the profile, the distribution of the pollutant in the vertical. Question 33. Um, is there any particular browser in which Giovanni works best? I'm actually not sure of the answer to this, but if it was slow for you today, um, just try at a different time when many people are not accessing the webinar um, at one time. Um, and after today, you can use the regular uh, NASA Giovanni link rather than the beta I linked to today. Question 34, can all these Giovanni steps for generating the maps be programmed through an API? Mm. I actually don't know the answer to that, but the, the help team for Giovanni is very responsive. So if you contact them, they'll be able to help you. They'll be able to at least answer that question. Uh, what is happening? Question 35. What is happening, I guess, from a calculation perspective when you choose data smoothing? So I am not sure over how many pixels uh, the picture is being averaged. There is data. Um, in the Giovanni website about what exact calculations are being made when we talk about smoothing. Um, but essentially it's area averaging um, just to smooth out the edges. Question 36, how well does NO2 derived from OMI Agree with data from ground stations. Could you provide some references to researches that looked into this? Um, that how well um, tropospheric column NO2 from OMI agrees with ground data will vary in time and spatially. Um, so I can't give just a general number. Um, for references, I would look up Locke Lamsell. He is a researcher at NASA Goddard. Um, he has done uh, a lot of work with this, and you can use references within his publications. Um, I referenced uh, his publication uh, within, within the training materials. Is 2020 data also from OMI or from TropoMI? Uh, in this presentation, we only show data for OMI but both instruments are currently taking measurements. 
is it possible to select a city by the name? Oh, in Giovanni. Um, I'm not sure. I haven't tried to look for a shapefile for a given city. Um, I'm, I'm not actually sure, but you can zoom in. Um, okay, my colleague does not believe that you can search just for a given city. Uh, I, I, I am inclined to agree. Um, question 39, is it possible to download a net CDF and then plot the data using Python? Absolutely, absolutely. So if you wanted to use Giovanni to subset um, and then download the NetCDF and plot using other software. Absolutely. I believe the GES disk also allows you to subset. The difference between the GES disk and Giovanni is the GES disk is just for download and not for visualization. It's not for making maps. I don't. Question 40, I don't quite understand the effect of maximum or minimum data range selecting. Why did you change from two to one? I did that because I knew that if I had left, so I knew I was going to be comparing different time ranges. And I also knew that the air quality has greatly improved over the past 10 or 15 years. So if I kept it at two, 2015 and 2020 would have likely looked exactly the same. You wouldn't have really been able to see any of the features. By reducing the maximum number, so in other words, the darkest shade of red was now 1 times 10 to the 16th rather than 2, um, it allows me to see uh, more features when the air was cleaner. Question 41, what are the units in the definition of data range at Giovanni? Uh, those were molecules per centimeter squared. Um, the units uh, can be seen in the plot title. Which tool and to work with a time series of years? So if you want to make a plot of a time series, over a given region, um, over some years, uh, Giovanni can do that. If you want to make your own, you can download the data from the websites uh, that I described. Question 43, can we compare ground-based data, which are in PPM and satellite data from OMI, which is in molecules? So, okay, I, th I think I've answered question 43 a couple times, but it, but again, um, in order to convert one to the other, you need information about the vertical distribution of the pollutant. But changes in the surface in PPM and in the tropospheric column will relate to one another. Question 44, is there any publicly available training material or Jupyter notebook to analyze OMI data in Python or any software for analysis? So my colleague has linked to a uh, webinar we gave where we have Python codes available to read OMI um, and MODIS data. Um, and these codes will allow you to create a map. And this is all using level two native resolution data, not gridded level three data. That's something that we're working on. These are Python codes. Um, where we have participants download Anaconda in order to use them. We're currently working on updating uh, our material to experiment with things like Jupyter Notebooks. Um, our advanced webinar, our advanced NO2 webinar from last year also contains um, these codes as well as codes for Tropomi. Um, all right, thank you so much to everybody for joining us today. Um, I hope you learned a little something and please join us when Dr. Pawan Gupta and uh, Dr. Prados will uh, talk more about aerosols. Thanks very much.